Tick tock, tick tock, the clock is ticking and time is running out. The year 2021, just like the previous years, has come and gone, inching us closer to the finish line of the President Muhammadu Buhari led administration. It's already seven years into the life of the APC government, which began with the mantra of change and now the next level. But how the level has changed remains a debatable conversation in some quarters. As the year 2023 inches closer, the conversation about politics, policy and legacy becomes louder, with various actors hobnobbing to position themselves strategically. Touching on a range of issues, President Muhammadu Buhari in an interview gave responses to some of the current realities confronting the nation, ranging from his fight against insecurity, the nation's economy, corruption and national cohesion. How has the country changed in the last few years and how important is the year 2022 for both the leaders and the led in Nigeria? This will be the issue of focus today. Welcome to the program. I am Ayubaila. Thank you for joining. Now, before the conversation begins, let's take a look at excerpts from the President's interview with Channels Television, beginning with insecurity. In the Northwest, it's the same people, the same culture, stealing each other's animals, killing each other, burning villages. So I think the only language they, they understand, we discuss it thoroughly with the law enforcement agencies, the service chiefs, the inspector general of police, is to go after, uh, you know, the, the terrorists. We label them terrorists, and we are going to deal with them with such. And I believe if you go to those constituencies in the Northwest and North Central, within the last four weeks, there are improvements in the security. The ministers of agriculture from out of Obe to Mahmoud now, uh, one of the issues I discussed with them personally is to go and get the gazettes of First Republic, especially from the northern states. There are cattle routes and grazing grounds. And uh, the uh, cattle areas are confined to those areas. Those that go outside that one are arrested, and farmers are encouraged to come and lay their claims. If they don't have the money, their cattle are, were sold, and the farmers are settled. So we said we have to go back uh, to the system again uh, to try and make sure that uh, we prepare the grazing areas, ass dumps, windy mills, uh, you know, e even veterinary departments, so that the herders don't stray into people's farms and uh, into the towns and so on. So really, we, we, we are working on that. You see, the role of traditional rulers must not be undermined. Because in their areas, as I said, they know who is who. Even by families, not even talk of individuals. So we have to revert to that uh, system for us to have an effective security in the localities. Uh, for example, there were two governors that came to see me about problem, and I don't mind telling, saying that the governors of uh, uh, um, Oyo State and the governor of uh, uh, this other state in uh, Ondo, not Ondo, Oyo State and one other. No, state police is not an option. Now, find out now the relationship between local government and the governors. Are they getting, as the third tier of government, are they getting what they are supposed to get constitutionally? Are they getting it? Try and see those people from local government that have confidence in you to tell you the truth. 
Now, joining me in the studio to discuss this is public affairs analyst Dr. Umar Abubakar Kari and also Daniel Bwala, legal practitioner and a chieftain of the APC who joins us uh, virtually. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen, and welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, let's begin by taking excerpt from a recent article published by Daniel Bwala, uh, which is, he titled, President Buhari and the Finish Line. Now, uh, if you can hear me, uh, Mr. Bwala, uh, you said, and I quote, Finish Line is always a challenge the world over. The devotion and dedication that one requires to ensure one finishes well is always a daunting task before and 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 that therefore it is widely believed that most presidents around the world lose their popularity both in the opinion polls and public trust now the reason is because the end of the second term provides the opportunity to score and assess presidents as against their campaign uh, promises. Now, looking at all that we have seen and, you know, from this recent discussions, would you say that the president has been able to retain his approval rating as against when he assumed office, you know, uh, you know uh, from what we are seeing now? Thank you very much. Uh, if I have to give a direct answer to it, I will say that the president may not have retained his approval rating because the comparison is with when he was elected. When he was elected, there were lots of expectations. He wasn't tested. The Nigerians were tired with the administration of President Jonathan. And because of the insecurity that was brewing at the time, anybody coming to take over the reins of power could be like a misery to them. And that was the reception with which Buhari was received. And the first few months, people could understand with his uh, plight because it was reported that the the, 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 the government in transition was not cooperating in terms of the transition process. But you see, that's why the article came, because all presidents the world over, if you put them in percentage uh, basis, you are likely to have less than 20% of presidents around the world in their second term towards the finish line that you can de uh, definitely say they were able to retain their approval rating. In fact, in America, they say in modern history, it was Bill Clinton that was able to retain, I think, about 49 or 50 percent of the approval rating. All other presidents in their second term, they found it very difficult. And I think President Buhari is confronted with the same situation. And there is always going to be two sets of people giving the assessment. There are individuals who are in the general population. They don't know the dynamics of politics. They don't know the implications of the economy. The only is that they expected that when you took over the reins of power by now, food should be on the table, their problem should be saved, and their problem unsolved. So they don't listen to rational analytical reasoning as to the excuse that the president will give. The other sets are the people who, even though they have seen that your approval rating has come down, but they try to then analyze and see whether it is excusable. In any case, the expectations of Nigerians is justifiable, isn't it? Especially if you look at some of the indices of the economy, you know, like we are seeing today, where you see the exchange rate is on another level, you know, unemployment, you know, food inflation, core inflation, and the rest of them. Maybe let me let uh, uh, Dr. Abubakar to chip in, you know, on this. Well, yeah, I think uh, to an extent uh, it is true uh, that the law of diminishing returns uh, if that is what we are going to apply, uh, applies to approval ratings of uh, presidents and other heads of government to an extent, but it is not always. Uh, Barista Bola mentioned the United States. I think uh, before Clinton, there was a consensus that uh, Roosevelt left with a high approval rating. And just recently, uh, Angela Merkel of Germany, uh, she's regarded as the greatest German uh, chancellor after the Second World War. Uh, the unification of Germany, I think she also left with a high approval rating. Uh, for me, the major determinant of approval rating all over the place uh, is always performance or lack of it. A president that truly performs in the expectation of most of the citizens will likely uh, go with very high approval rating. And I think the problem that Buhari has had, uh, 
uh, is that he came on the crest of uh, unprecedented popularity. Uh, in fact, uh, the jury is still out, as they say in law, whether Buhari uh, has been the most popular presidential candidate in Nigeria history. The kind of uh, groundswell of support that he garnered uh, in the build up to the 20, uh, 2015 presidential election was so high, uh, he attracted so much crowds. Yeah, I must admit that all this translated into high expectations. And I regret to say that uh, the performance of Buhari so far, uh, almost seven years, uh, is not or does not conform to the high expectations that Nigerians are reports in him in 2015. And so for me, that is the major reason why his uh, popularity or approval rating has, uh, uh, has so dipped. Okay. All right. Uh, Daniel Boala, uh, let's talk about, you know, this, econ <laughs> this crisis economy, you know, that you talk about. Like you mentioned, security issue is on the lips of virtually everyone. People are concerned. And, uh, you know, people can literally, you know, not be able to travel, you know, on our roads uh, in recent times. And a lot of people thought, okay, the president is a retired general and he should be able to bring his experience to bear. What are we missing, really, in, in this fight against corruption? He has put forward certain solutions, you know, in, from his discussion uh, in that interview, which is going back to traditional rulers and local intelligence. And he categorically said that state police is a no-no. I know you have been someone that, you know, has been advocating for state police. So what would be your thinking around this? Right. Yeah. You know, the, he is a retired general, but uh, all of his military service, uh, they were trained to fight conventional war. What we are faced with in Nigeria today, both the soldiers and the masses are learning. It is like the case of coronavirus. Both the scientists and we, the people, we are all learning. As data has come, we are able to analyze. You see, because Boko Haram, Bandit, and some of these recent uh, emerging crises, they took a different dimension. No longer conventional where you bring your armory, your soldiers, and you face one side. These ones operate in the population. They operate in the cyberspace. They operate in different areas. So in the dynamics of the insecurity necessitated the need for the Nigerian people, and by extension, the Nigerian security forces, to also evolve into learning how to deal with that uh, kind of situation. So it is tough. And in fact, when Jonathan was in power, at the beginning, people thought it was that simple. I remember when the president was quoted to have said, in three months after he comes to power, he will wipe it. But as soon as he came, he discovered the thing is multifaceted and hydra-headed. Now, crisis economy is the biggest challenge the world over. Uh, crisis economy is a situation where the crisis is so deepened that people have found economy in the crisis. That is to say, just like the way you discover oil for money, people have discovered that doing crisis, creating crisis, deepening the crisis, multiplying the crisis, is a means of getting the money. So that's where you find banditry and kidnapping now involving security forces, involving traditional heads. And that is why, in my view, the president succinctly captured when he was granted this um, interview and he said that the situation is to be dealt with right from the local level that's a good one the only part that didn't go down well with me and like you rightly asked in your question is whether uh, you can succeed in that without creating a state police i think you cannot because the world has changed i can understand the fears of the president he may be looking at it from our heterogeneous nature and the fact that things have happened or are happening in the country that have so created so much of divide that the minute you give room for state police is likely going to create a case of secession. That thinking needs to be challenged because the world has changed. Now, state police is nothing more than calling it a local police. So anytime it is called state police, people get scared. But if we have used the word local police, Maybe even the president would have been confident, comfortable with that. Because what he was suggesting in his advice is actually local policing. He's talking about going to the traditional leaders. They have local intelligence about who are the foreigners, who are the people operating within their place, and then engaging them. 
they forming a kind of a, 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 a guard, like a watchdog or watch group, whatever the name or the nomenclature is, who are now going to be like a beacon of protection for that locality. That is local policy. Which seems like so I think what, is something that we already have going on, isn't it? Yes, we do have. The only difference... Right. The only problem is that they are not armed to deal with uh, threats that require ammunition. Yeah. Mm. All right. Now, we have seen that uh, even the traditional rulers that we are talking about themselves uh, seem to be under some kind of threat. You know, we have had several abduction of traditional rulers. Sometimes even they are being killed and all of that. So when the president profess, you know, such, you know, ideas as the way out of this, how exactly do we intend to go about it? In your opinion, doctor? Yeah, I'm sorry to say that there is some element of uh, uh, oversimplification in uh, the president's uh, advocacy of uh, uh, traditional rulers uh, playing a role uh, in policy. Because since the 1960s, uh, or at least since the Dasuki uh, panel report uh, implementation, I think uh, sometimes uh, between 1975 and 1980, I cannot remember, the powers of these uh, traditional rulers have been substantially uh, clipped or eroded. They will not be able to play any meaningful role uh, or, unless and until you place uh, some kind of coercion, I mean the instrument of coercion around them. You mentioned, okay, that uh, many of them uh, have also fallen victims. Uh, on the other hand, unfortunately, many of them have also been found uh, wanting uh, as uh, willing or uh, unwilling uh, accomplices in the perpetration uh, of the crime itself. Therefore, if we should give role to traditional rulers, and we should, then we should be able to uh, reassess their powers and responsibilities uh, and confer on them certain extra powers that uh, will uh, make it possible for them to function. Otherwise, they will, uh, their role will seem to be, I mean, will simply be limited to uh, reporting uh, individuals and events. And I think uh, that will not be uh, effective enough. And then on the issue of state policing, uh, my problem with state police is that uh, it is not only a controversial concept, but uh, there is not exact definition of what it entails. Uh, most people... I mean, and state I, police, what, does it, what, what definition do we need really to, to deconstruct what state police is? I have read a number state of... police? No, I have read a number of perspectives uh, about it. What came out of the president's uh, interview for me uh, was uh, a kind of police that are uh, uh, wholly under the control and uh, 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 supervision of state governors. And because the president uh, rightly observed that the governors themselves have not been doing well, uh, they have not been acting uh, democratic, they have been uh, compromising or even uh, destroying uh, democratic institutions. Therefore, they are not the best people to be saddled so, with such responsibilities. So, so. But then there is the other perspective that mm. it is only an aspect of policy that should be given to the state police. That we can still have a federal police like the FBI, uh, some aspect of policy uh, or certain acts and omissions can be termed as uh, federal uh, issues or federal uh, offenses uh, to be covered by the federal police mm -hmm. while we also have uh, other responsibilities for the uh, uh, state police. Therefore, the first challenge is to define what does this state policing entail. Mm. All right. Now, with the current structure that we have, let me throw this to Daniel Boala. Uh, the current policing structure that we have, is it tenable, you know, for Nigeria to be able to, you know, fight the current challenges that we're dealing with in terms of uh, security? 
Certainly no, because we have less than 350,000 police. And I think the United Nations um, the requirement for policing, we are far, 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 far below. In fact, with a population of over 200 million, even 1 million police is still not enough for policing in the 21st century. And uh, the fears of the president can also be translated into the fears of whether You see, the Constitution is clear about the separation of power. Now, the powers conferred on the president, that same power is conferred on governors at the local level. So if the president can control federal police and the governors cannot have the powers to control local police, it becomes difficult for the governors to take care of insecurity within their terrain. So why do we call them chief security officers of the state? Is it to provide funding? And it is, it is the same thing about enforcement. Now, let me... Let me say that sometimes when we reject a concept, we try to create issue around it to say that we have a problem of definition. That is the reason why we are not agreeable, like the case of the structure. But as a consultant in the National Assembly, even the state police, we have provided a um, uh, alteration of the constitution to create state police. But this is how we did it. We went to section 308 and altered section 308 to say that if the governor, that is to say, we are talking about items that are not covered by immunity. In other words, the immunity of the governor now is no longer absolute. So if the fears of the president is that uh, the governors are not democratic, so they are more likely to use these local forces, just like the way they be using talks and some of the people at the, at the state level. The same fear has been extended to the president. We are lucky that we have a president who abides by the rule of law. But in this country, we have had presidents that remove governors. You know? So the same fears for the state is the same thing that is extended to the federation. The solution is to create a balance, and this is what we uh, uh, propose. That if the governor or the president use the police to one, uh, uh, humiliate opponent or kill opponent, to abuse the due process of law, then that president or that governor shall not be covered by immunity. If that becomes law, it means that states can have the powers to create their state police, but the powers of the governor to use the police are checked as circumscribed by the Constitution, and that if the governor goes beyond that, then he can be prosecuted. Once we do that, let's give it for first four years. If it doesn't work, then we know where we take it from there. It's like the issue of direct primaries. We cannot keep being afraid of the unknown that we don't challenge the status quo, or else we are going to remain the way we are 100 years after now. Mm. All right, let me also get your thoughts on you know the, the solution to Heather's farmers' crisis. The president have always talked about these grazing routes, you know, as a way to uh, curb this conflict, you know, that we have seen. Um, how practical would you say that uh, solution is? You know, looking at the, the current realities that we have? Fortunately enough, the president is alone in that thinking. And it was the apostle, um, uh, attorney general that advised him. Now, when the president asks that the old northern Nigerian grazing law should be given, should be just it and bring it, you need to know that the old Niger northern Nigerian grazing laws applies only to the northern Nigeria. And at the time, we had the northern Nigeria, the western, and Europe, but we have had states now state with distinctive characteristics, state with powers, state with responsibilities, and with their local state assembly to enact. That grazing uh, law of the northern Nigeria can no longer work in the 21st century. That's number one. Number two, it is not even viable for improving the economic life of the herders to continue to maintain that the herders should apply the grazing rule. The ranching is the way out, and thankfully, all the northern governors at the as at, uh, I think last year, last quarter of last year, all the northern governors have subscribed to ranching. Only the president that has not yet been convinced that ranching is the way. Government has introduced three different uh, 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 strategy of dealing with that situation. All of that governors accepted, but the president has still not yet been convinced that ranching rather than grazing route is going to work. So I see a situation where he will leave out his time and the next president will come and then if we have progressive governors, then that will be applicable. Intriguing enough, most of the states that have the highest number of 
elders or rather people who historically are known as elders they embrace that can you embrace Kaduna embraced in fact a lot of the northern uh, the states they've embraced that but the commander-in-chief of the armed forces is still not convinced with that all right well let's take a quick break now and then when we come back we'll continue our discussion on the program please stay with us i've identified that no country can develop without infrastructure and infrastructure means roads, rail, power. These are three leading ones. And uh, we are working very hard. When I say we, I mean this government, we are working very hard on the road. Now we are doing from Lagos to Kano, the rail road from here to Kaduna to Kano. So we have to have that infrastructure right. And then Nigeria will mind, Nigerian will mind their own businesses. But when you can, when, when the infrastructure is not there, the roads are not done, the rail is virtually killed, there is no power. What do you expect people to do? But I am telling you that we are totally aware that Nigerian population, 35 years and below, are the majority. And they don't care how government is going to make it, let them get a job for them. But I've just told you that land, only 2.5% of the arable land is being cultivated. So we are going to turn our attention for the time remaining for us to agriculture, but clear land, machinery, and so on. Probably, unfortunately, there is political problem. In the South, there is problem of land ownership very serious one. It's based on families and the ruling classes and so on. But luckily, uh, mostly in the north, that, that is, all land belongs to government. So government can take areas and, and so on. So I think for the time remaining for us, for the 17 months, we'll turn a lot to agriculture. We were set back. And it's resource shortage. Because we need to buy machinery. Machinery, tractors, clearing the land, dividing it, and encouraging people, you know, giving them seeds. You know, and fertilizers. And that costs money. All right, thank you for staying with us. If you're just joining, you're watching Issues on Trust Television. And here today, we, will be, we are looking at the state of the nation in regards to the president's recent interviews. Now, I have in the studio Dr. Abubakar Umar Kari and also joining us virtually, uh, Daniel Bwala, legal practitioner and also uh, chieftain of the APC. Now, Let's talk about, you know, uh, navigating around the economy of politics. <laughs> Daniel Bala, you know uh, better, you know, what, what I'm talking about. In your article, you made reference to how important this year is to uh, the issues of policy implementation and how the president can successfully finish well. The president talked about, you know, investing heavily in agriculture. He says 2.5 percent of the Nigeria's arable land uh, is, the, is what we have cultivated. And so as a way to revamp the economy, he feels that going back to the lands is the way out uh, of here. But we have seen the massive investment so far, even from 2015 till now, we've seen several programs by the central bank, you know, aimed at investing heavily on the agriculture. But if you ask uh, a lot of people who say, well, we are not seeing results. I mean, looking at the food inflation that we are uh, suffering through. So what exactly is the problem between uh, policy and implementation here? Well, the president is right. The reason why we see inflation is because the, the means of production is low. But you cannot deny the fact that from when the president introduced a vigorous approach to this boosting the agricultural sector, by even attempting to close the borders, we were importing rice before. Now we're exporting it. And we have food. So the reason why we have inflation is because the means of production is low. And that is what he's uh, suggesting to the Nigerian people that, look, we have enormous opportunities and potentials. Why don't you look into it rather than just looking at one direction? Now, if you ask me, if Nigeria is to be in a country like the Western countries, especially European countries, quite frankly, there will be a unanimity of purpose. 
to implement what the president has suggested. And even if it is only agriculture, with the kind of arable land that we have, believe me, we can be a nation to be reckoned with. You see, the reason why lots of people don't seem to buy, uh, they, don't, they don't seem to agree or buy the ideas of the president, unfortunately for him, but he will go down to history as the greatest president in Nigeria's history. Allow me to explain. You see, most presidents, and that's why I talked about the economy of politics and politics of the economy, politicians are only interested in projects that will give them talking points in the next cycle of election. That is why they don't embark on a long-term project. They want a project of one year, two years, at least when they go to election, there is something to keep pointing out to the masses and say, we did it, we did that. That's why you see shambolic bridges being created, shambolic roads, artificial, all kinds of things. But you see, it takes a courageous man to look at a long-term project that will probably, the fruit will start coming long after he has gone. So, for example, we can abuse him, but maybe five, ten years after he has gone, these millennials that are on social media abusing the president, the last time the rail walk, the railroad walked, they were not born. So they cannot have a firm grasp of what the president is talking about. Most of this project, the deep seaport, the, the, the roads, the railroad, uh, talking about powering of uh, schools, powering of the market, creating an enabling environment for economic activities. If you look at most of them, they are, they are time, usually after three years, after four years. So long after he has gone is when we will begin to see the fullness of those things he's investing in. It's called long-term plan. The people of this generation will certainly not be comfortable with that. But believe me, we look at the nations like in the, in the, in the Western world, and we celebrate them because of this revolutionary thing they have taken. It is the same thing that the president is talking about. And people don't seem to agree with him. Okay, okay, Dr. Kari, um, you know, the, the situation of Nigeria's economy and security looks like that of the chicken and the egg. You, you almost cannot say, okay, which one should come first? Which one should government focus more on? Because on one hand, you, you say, well, the f what is fueling the security situation is the, the poverty in the land and the unemployment in the land. People have said that. And on the, on the other hand, you cannot get the economy running when you, know, you, you do not have infrastructure in place. So uh, how do we you know, navigate you know, around this, specifically looking at the fact that this is virtually the last year of the president in office? Yeah, I agree with you that uh, security and uh, economy are mutually reinforcing. And uh, there is this very strong nexus that uh, connects them. Uh, but then we have to separate them uh, in order to understand them very well. Uh, for instance, no society, no community uh, or group will even succeed, I mean uh, survive in the first place without security. And if you go back to political theory, of course, the very reason and essence of existence of government is to secure the lives uh, of the members of the society or community. And therefore, for me, I will always place security before uh, economy. That is not to say that uh, economy is not very, very important. Uh, as for the reason of insecurity, uh, poverty is just one uh, factor. It's a multi-factor thing. Uh, Barista Bora uh, has mentioned it. It's a hydra-headed problem. Uh, it touches history. It touches uh, economy, uh, sociology, uh, politics, and so on and so forth. And that is why people are amazed that uh, it appears that insecurity has defied solution under uh, a general uh, like Buhari. Uh, given the fact that Buhari himself identified uh, the economy uh, when he first took over as one area that uh, he was going to concentrate on, uh, security, economy, and uh, anti-corruption. And it appears... Uh, in almost all his pronouncements, uh, interviews, uh, and talks, he usually reduces the issue of security or insecurity to the Boko Haram uh, insurgency. And this is just uh, one aspect of it. I remember in the last interview, he even gave himself a pass mark. He has been doing that. 
he has been uh, regurgitating a particular point that uh, when he first came in, about 40 local government areas were in the hands of the Boko Haram. But the reality is that the problem of insecurity uh, goes beyond the Boko Haram uh, insurgency. As a matter of fact, I will even give his government uh, kudos uh, for to an extent tackling the issue of Boko Haram. Okay, my state, for instance, uh, okay, Bochi, we have forgotten about Boko Haram. But then uh, a more serious problem, uh, so to say, uh, is rearing its uh, ugly heads all over the north and even other parts of the country, which is the banditry. And the other uh, problems of communal, sectarian uh, violence have only been compounded. None of them uh, has been solved. And all these things dovetail into the economy and compounds the problem of uh, 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 misery. Mm. When he first came, uh, to be sincere, you have to give allowance to Buhari because immediately he came in, he ran into problem with the, uh, with the Niger Delta militants. They were blowing up uh, oil pipeline and that literally grounded the economy. Mm. He was able to overcome that and then uh, under him, Nigeria twice came out of a recession. Kudos uh, should be given to him. But beyond that, there doesn't appear to be uh, coherence in the management of the economy. We don't know the kind of uh, economic system okay, that has been uh, implemented. And his government has contradicted itself so many times uh, in terms of the economic direction uh, on the issue of debt, uh, uh, debt servicing, uh, budget uh, implementation, the issue of giving uh, emphasis to capital projects, uh, versus the recurrent uh, expenditure, and so on and so forth. And so many Nigerians have complained that there has been a complete absence of an uh, economic team. Uh, interestingly, it was only this week that an economic advisor uh, was appointed. Mm. So all this shows poor management of the economy, mm. which uh, the Buhari government can actually not run away from. Mm. All right, let, let's look at the fight against corruption. I mean, this is one of the cardinal things that the president has you know, always advocated and champion, you know, in his administration. Uh, we've seen a couple of figureheads, you know, under this administration that have been alleged, or I would say accused, of corrupt practices. And, in fact, even the, the, the chief loot, I would say the, 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 the chief lieutenant, if there's anything like that, uh, of the anti-corruption graft himself uh, has been fingered, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, corrupt practices and all of that. How are we tackling that in ensuring that government policies yield the desired results? The problems of um, anti-corruption fight in Nigeria, I think, is institutional. Institutional in the sense that uh, the institutions are willing to work, but there are interventions sometimes from the executive. And what I mean executive, I'm not talking about the president of Nigeria. I'm talking about members of the executive can be heads of certain departments and ministries of government that probably have uh, overseen uh, uh, influence over those uh, commissions. Now, but I think EFCC yesterday, they published the success rate of uh, convictions in the last, I think, one year or two years, I think, about over 2,200 and something, which is quite massive, because it's, for the first time, more in number than the previous achievement. But critics will tell you still that most of these convictions are Yahoo Yahoo boys, and they are not convictions you secure in a full trial in court. Usually it's through plea bargain, or out of fear they will just go to uh, the court and plead guilty. But that, that is not the thing. That's not the crux of the commission. The, the reason the commission was established, principally, was to ensure that people who come into public office in Nigeria do not misappropriate funds that are committed to them, the public, public trust. So, for example, you can bring... 100 Yahoo Yahoo activities together, it might not equate two or three governors who have laundered the treasury of their respective states. So people will tell you, if you have to give a fair assessment, you will see the anti-corruption is not very successful because the very core purpose and the reason for which it was established were still not achieved. Until 1999, today, I think we, don't, we have less than five governors convicted. And recently, most recently, 
we see an opinion that is going around that even the Supreme Court, I haven't read that, so I will not make a conclusion on that, but that even the Supreme Court said that governors, after they leave their office, could not be prosecuted. The minute that is established, they have destroyed democracy in Nigeria. But all it means is for me to become a governor and then go and get myself a payday. When I come down, nothing will happen. Even when I was asked, I think yesterday, no, two days ago, in an interview, I said, you cannot blame in 100% the executive branch of government because the executive branch may investigate can even arrest them the minute they are charged to court we are now at the mercy of the judiciary and because the reason why some people even say that the supreme court could have the audacity to say that is because most of these tribunal cases that go to the supreme court are means by which they get their payday so we're in a deep rooted problem so, so the executive can do his best strengthening the judicial system really to help in this fight against corruption well, uh, most the proponent of the institutional strengthening have said that the judiciary in Nigeria needs autonomy. They already have. They talked about funding. Uh, at the federal level, at least we know that they get their money first line charge. We know that the president cannot interfere. In fact, those who interfere on the judiciary are, local, are governors more than people at the federal level. But at the state level, until recently, the president had to fight with the governors to then grant autonomy to the judiciary and the legislature at the state level. They still depend on the governors for their budget. So people believe that the minute they have control of their financing, they, you will not be able to intervene. But again, the counter-argument is that the Supreme Court do not collect their salary from, uh, from uh, governors. You know, they are not paid from governors you know, by, of respective states. But how is it that governors are able to influence them? That is because people say corruption when it is intrinsically establishing someone, the fact that he's rich or he's not rich, he's in Abuja or he's in Lagos, will never be a problem until there is a punitive measure. I believe that if we have more governors going to jail, for real, and the trials are concluded in two years, it will scare others from going into corrupt practices. But for now, all they believe is make more money and hire big lawyers and stretch the prosecution case until that president who thinks he will fight uh, um, anti-corruption leaves office another one come then you negotiate all right now let's take a quick break and then when we come back we'll take a look at the issue of legacy this is 2022 the eve of uh, you no know, general elections in nigeria so please stay with us <music> I, I consider myself lucky. My party and their competent leadership are both leading in the Senate and the House of Representatives. That's why you don't hear much about me. I allow them to do all the things because I can't go against my party and I can't go against people I have absolute confidence in. I know they are doing their best. Support. No, I'm not going to support. Personally, I don't support direct primaries because I want people to be given a choice. You can't give them one option and, and, and you think that you are being democratic. Let them have three, the three options. Mm -hmm. 2023 elections, what comes to your mind? It's not my problem. You're not going to be interested in who succeeds you? No, let him come whoever it is. All important things, I, must, I made sure that they are on record. Nobody should ask me to come and give you any evidence in any court. Otherwise, whoever it is, he will be in trouble. Because all important things are on record. I made sure about that. Important issues are all on record. You don't have any favorite for 2023 in your party? No, I wouldn't because uh, he may be eliminated if I mention it. I better keep it, it secret. Well, I think uh, my legacy is that um, I try to make sure that um, we conducted ourselves with integrity. That means we stopped all the stealings as much as the system can allow. We stop with appropriation. And for Nigeria, that is very, very important. The expectation 
from Nigeria I came with a young population, the expectation is so high that we must make sure that the resources are managed properly and that they understand resources are being managed properly. If they don't, if they don't, if they rebel, there will be trouble, a lot of trouble. All right, thank you for staying with us and if you're just joining, this is Issues, taking a look at the state of the nation vis-a-vis -vis the recent interview granted by the president. Now, we have joining us virtually Daniel Bwala, a legal practitioner and also a chieftain uh, of the uh, All Progressives Congress. And also in the studio, Dr. Abubakar Omar Akari is here with us, public affairs analyst. Now, let's take a look at the issue of legacy. From the interview of the president, he gave a sense of what is going to happen in 2023. Uh, he said he doesn't care really about who becomes his successor uh, and all of that. Uh, how important is that, you know, as far as uh, the president's legacy is concerned? Let me begin with uh, uh, Daniel Bwala. What the president said is the very opposite of what I suggested in my article, because in my article I said, that the president must be involved in the selection process. Otherwise, he should forget about his legacy. And the premise on which I give that advice is because they say characteristically, the president does not interfere in all elections. No matter what. And I can tell you as a member of APC, how attempts were made. Remember in 2015, when they wanted him to weigh in on the emergence of leaders of the National Assembly? He did not. In 2019, they brought the same pressure. But you see, you can decide not to care if you don't have a legacy you want preserved. But if you want your legacy to be preserved, you must be conscious, you must be careful, and you must be involved in the process that will lead to the selection of the person that will succeed you. Otherwise, give for example, like I said when we began, most of these projects will be completed after he has gone. If the man who succeeds you does not believe in your vision, does not subscribe to your ideology, does not believe in what you believe in, and it happens to emerge from your party, these are going to be abandoned projects all across the nation. So in the area of infrastructure, you don't have any legacy. Secondly, in the area of the rule of law, you're fighting to ensure that the institutions of government function in accordance with the law. If you are not careful about the person that will succeed you, who will also push from where you're pushing, then they are likely to reverse everything that you have done. So I maintain the same position, except if the president is playing what we call the Machiavelli principle, where you tell the world you will not be involved, but on the ground you are involved. But he has to be involved about who, um, who uh, succeeds him. To what extent can the president actually be involved you know, in the politics of 2023, looking at that there are more pressing issues you know, in this year to, to be looked at? Yeah, before then, I think it's very important to say in the same interview, the president contradicted himself even about uh, getting involved. Uh, on the one hand, he said he doesn't care who succeeds him. But on the other hand, he says he will keep uh, his own preferred candidate to himself so that the person will not be eliminated. And that says something, which means that the president is not exactly disinterested in who succeeds him. If that is a uh, Machiavellian uh, threat, uh, so be it. And as to to what extent the president can, uh, can get involved, of course, uh, it is very, very obvious. Uh, the Fourth Republic, since 1999, uh, parties have been under the thumb of the presidency and governors. You will agree with me, and many Nigerians uh, certainly will, that uh, the APC at the national level uh, most time dances to the dictates of the presidency. Therefore, the presidency will likely play a very significant role on who emerges as the presidential candidate uh, of the party, uh, both subterraneanly and uh, obviously. In other words, the president may decide to have a candidate and work assiduously towards uh, his own preferred choice, mm -hmm. imagine, as the flag bearer of the party. Okay. That is one. The Second, mm -hmm. to also fund that candidacy, to actively campaign for that candidacy, or to take whatever steps 
he deems fit really? towards ensuring that that person emerges. So that's the extent of the possible involvement. Okay. All right. Well, our time is running out, really. But briefly, before we go, uh, Mr. Daniel Boala, uh, there's a lot of internal crisis that we are already seeing, cracks in the APC. Uh, so maybe if you look at, say, the crisis between Uzo Dima and uh, uh, Rochas of Korocha in Imo State, for instance. What the implication of this, you know, for the party? This is 2022, and everyone is talking about 2023. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually concerned as a member of APC because uh, Imo State was the first state in the East Southeast that uh, we had as the APC led state before Ebony joined. And uh, remember, it was from Abga, it became APC. And uh, we were looking at Imo State to be like the bastion of hope for the proliferation of the party in the Southeast. Unfortunately, the very person who led the movement, which was Rocha Sokorocha, has now been overwhelmed by personal quest to create and establish a dynasty. So that is why we have the problems in Imo. He ruled for eight years. In fact, one of the occasions he won election, nobody even challenged him in court. That's how far he was allowed to operate. But when he was leaving, he wanted to impose his son in law. He didn't get that. Now he's fighting everybody. The person that won the election at the beginning, he he fought him. When Wopuzo Dima now went to court, the Supreme Court interpreted he was a governor, he started fighting him. We do not have peace in Imo because of his quest and desire to ensure that he depopularized the governor. Meanwhile, he has his own ambition for presidential election. So how can you succeed? Most of these presidential hopefuls you see in APC, look at them in their state. Let's say Asiwaju, Lagos is firmly behind him. Rotimi Amechi, Potako, I mean, River State is firmly behind him, at least his faction. If you look at uh, Fashola too, a good number of people. It is only Rochas Okorocha in Debo Mahi. People in his state, they are firmly behind But in the case of Rochas, he is at war with his state. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you'll be able to achieve what he wants. Okay, but uh, some political watchers, you know, are, are saying that, look, this cracks spell doom for the APC. Uh, if you look at the camps that we're already seeing, the Asiwaju there, the, the Osibanjo there, and the rest of them. What, what are your thoughts around Well, uh, it uh, may uh, not translate into doom, uh, even though I agree uh, that the APC should be worried. It is in the nature of politics to have camps, cleavages, tendencies, groups and factions, and so on and so forth. Uh, it will only spell doom if APC as a party has not been able to uh, address the problem they have been trying to do. And beyond IMO, APC's problems are all over the place, in Kano, uh, in Gombe, even the, in, uh, in Rivers, in Kwara, uh, in Bochi, and all over the place. So it's, uh, the, the party should be quite worried. Mm. Uh, but I think it is also in the nature of politics uh, for politicians to sing their differences when many Nigerians think uh, that uh, the ship is going to sink. But if APC as a party fails to do that, uh, then uh, it may well spell doom. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for staying on the program. And thank you to you, our viewers there. We have to end the show at this point. We look forward to having you on the program again. Thank you. Pleasure to be Thank you. Right. On that note, we wrap up the show. It's Issues. It comes to you every week here on Trust Television. And uh, here we look at a range of issues, governance, politics, and national issues of concern. My name is Ivelia. Thank you so much for watching. In case you've missed, you can catch up on our YouTube and also follow us across all social media handles. See you next week. Bye for now.